Good morning. Good morning. There we go. Uh, thank you so much for being here today. I also want to give a special thanks uh, to the Ethiopian community and the Ethiopian Community Center for having us back. Thank you very much. This is a very special place in our community, and for me personally, it's a particularly special place. When I was running as a candidate, I had the opportunity to spend some time here and listen to the families talk about their need for community space and claiming community space here in Seattle. And when I was sworn in as mayor, my first of five swearing-ins was here in this community center. <laughs> I think they like to say it was the only one that counted, but that's not true. Um, look, we know that our city has grown so rapidly, uh, and so many people have been pushed out, and the community has changed in ways that I think really threatens who we are as a city. And one of the ways we reclaim that is to show as a community we will listen to community, we will raise community up, and we will follow their dreams. And part of what we're announcing today is to show that our commitment to housing is just not a generic commitment, but it is a commitment to the people and to the families that need that housing. We know that as a city of the future, we can't let communities and families be left behind. More and more, it is our communities of color who are having a hard time staying in the city or being in the city at all. More and more of our communities of color have been pushed out. When I was growing up in Seattle, the Central District was over 70% African American, over 70%. Today it's about 14%. And when I listened to the Ethiopian community here, I learned about, you know, we have one of the richest and robust Ethiopian communities anywhere in the country. Some of them are generations old and some are newcomers. But they need a space for families to come together. And I think I saw my friend Estella Ortega here. There she is. Another thing I, you know, campaigning really heard and saw first very closely was that need to claim for community a center of place of being. And if you look at El Centro de la Raza today, it is that place. It's a place that, you know, years ago, people like Estella and Roberto Maestas claimed it for community. And then they decided not to let it go. <laughs> That's right. And they built it into something even better and had a vision where there would be housing and community space. And I heard how hard it was to get that vision because the city was not responsive to understanding how important it was for community to form their own bonds and their own places and to make sure the community spaces and housing and places for children were in one location. And so we've listened to that and we've heard that and we know that we have to do more and do better. Um, working with the city council, we know that we have done a lot in the last year and the last couple of years. Um, just taking some stock in the last two announcements under our housing levy and for affordable housing, we've announced over $700 million, $700 million. <laughs> And today, I'm very excited to say the city will be able to commit over 100 million new dollars for affordable housing. And we know, working with our partners, once we're able to leverage that, that could be even hundreds of millions of more dollars of housing where we need it. This summer, we announced our Housing Seattle Now, and our city council has stepped up in so many ways to make sure that we're working together to provide housing. In the budget that we signed last month, we invested nearly $13 million in the sale from the Mercer properties to build more affordable housing. We want to make sure we have the spectrum of housing, that our neighbors who are experiencing homelessness have permanent supportive housing so they can be stabilized and integrated and stay in our communities. So the communities like the Ethiopian community, the Filipino community, can build their own community centers that have housing for their communities attached to it. So we have done a lot, but we know we need to do more. I have to thank Emily Alvarado for all the work she and everyone at the Office of Housing has done.
And I see so many people here, I'd start calling everyone out by name, but for those who are in our housing development people, thank you for all you have done. For our Seattle Housing Authority, for the heads of my different departments, for those who are running some of our most difficult and largest shelters, thank you for the work all of you do to make Seattle a better place. I'm thrilled to say that we finally will be able to invest in the Ethiopian village, which represents It is an amazing vision that the community had, and the city was able to partner with that community to realize that dream. I want to thank the Ethiopian community for insisting on that dream, for staying together and having the vision and having the patience to work with the city. I also want to thank all those who have set the bar high for those kinds of developments we know we can do. Um, one of the projects that we will be funding also is for our LGBTQ affirming housing. Um, we know from our own studies that it is difficult for the LGBT community, particularly seniors, to have the kind of housing in their senior years that makes them feel adaptable. It's not that I'm picking out my own unit, um, <laughs> although I might. Um, but we know that that is yet another place in our community where there's been a gap in housing, and this is going to allow us to step up to do that. It's an important milestone for us in the, in the efforts for affordable housing. We, <laughs> we also know moving forward, uh, in the coming weeks, I'll be getting the recommendations from the Affordable Middle Class Housing Advisory Board, which I put together, the council. And because we also know that those middle class families are getting pushed and squeezed out of Seattle. Our teachers, our nurses, those who work really hard every day but can't afford to live in this city, we have to change that if we want Seattle to be truly the just and equitable place that we want it to be. I want to thank our state delegation for all the work they did to advance affordable housing. I don't know if Nicole Macri or Speaker Chop is here. But if not, each of them deserve a round of applause. I also want to call out uh, Council Member Teresa Mosqueda, who is on maternity leave, but she, we were able to pass through the ability to use our sales tax to have bonds to give us more affordable housing. She advocated for an Olympia. She made sure we were one of the first to take advantage of it. And she has been a tireless advocate for affordable housing in the city of Seattle. <laughs> and mostly, I also want to thank the people of Seattle. They were forward-looking enough to vote for a housing levy. And we all know we didn't do enough soon enough but again, we are always that city that steps up and says, we will tax ourselves for those things that matter. And people saw that there was going to be a need for housing. Unfortunately, the need outstripped our capabilities. But today, we take another very important step forward to fund some of the projects you're going to hear about. One of them, again, there's people in this room. I don't know if anyone is here from Africatown who has done a great job. There we go. <laughs> and there's Joaquin over there who saw the importance of reclaiming community for community and making sure that it could stand up, not just housing, but commercial properties that were for the community and by the community. And so bringing together all of those interests, we really can make sure that this city remains diverse and welcoming and that people can live in every corner of this city, regardless of who they are or where they work. And with that, I'd like to turn over to my head of my office of housing, the amazing Emily Alvarado. Thank you all, and thank you to Mayor Durkin for your demonstrated commitment to affordable housing, as is evidenced by all of these projects that we're funding today. Um, today, today, we make a historic investment in our values to create a more affordable and equitable city, to foster inclusion, to address homelessness, to advance sustainability, to further fair housing. Today, we invest in the basic human needs of our neighbors and in the basic infrastructure 
of our city. I am really privileged to announce investment in a record-breaking 1,944 homes. in 13 buildings across the city that will provide affordable housing for generations to come. Three buildings will provide homes for homeless individuals, including those surviving on the street, and support people with integrated health and social services. This model of permanent supportive housing is proven, cost-effective, and humane solution to homelessness, and we continue to invest in its results. <laughs> Funding awards include Hobson Place Two by DESC, 12th and Spruce by Plymouth Housing in partnership with St. Francis House, Madison Boylston by Plymouth Housing, a partnership with Bellwether Housing that includes a substantial number of other affordable rental units. <laughs> Two buildings will provide homes for seniors so they can age with dignity and safety near their families and near services that are culturally appropriate. Funding awards include the Eldridge by Capitol Hill Housing, an LGBTQ senior affirming building, and Ethiopian Village by Ethiopian Community in Seattle and Human Village. Eight buildings will provide homes to Seattle's working individuals and families, healthcare workers and preschool teachers, baristas and bartenders, musicians and fitness instructors, so that they not only work in Seattle, but they can live here too and provide predictability and stability for their families and children. Funding awards include Africatown Plaza by Africatown Community Land Trust and Capitol Hill Housing, Rose Street 2 by Bellwether Housing, Nesbitt Family Housing by the Low Income Housing Institute, Via 7 by Mount Baker Housing Association, Lambo by the Seattle Housing Authority, The Madison by Southport, North Lot by the Seattle Chinatown International District PDA, Willow Crossing by GMD Development. Thank you all. The benefits of these investments extend beyond homes for individual people. They serve our city as a whole. Through this investment, we address displacement and advance racial equity, including in neighborhoods like the Central District, where community-driven project seeks to reverse the impacts of displacement of the African-American community. And they help prevent displacement in communities like Rainier Beach so that there are affordable homes for long-standing community residents in place as neighborhoods change and grow. Through this investment, we deliver public benefits in ground floor spaces, child care centers like the one operated by El Centro de la Raza, health care facilities like the program of all-inclusive care for the elderly, social services like the Rainier Valley Food Bank, senior-focused community centers, and spaces for anchor and legacy businesses. We, we repurpose a temporary tiny home village into permanent affordable family housing. We rebuild new homes that were damaged by fire, reposition vacant public land to bring higher and greater benefits to our growing city. This historic $110 million investment includes many resources, but as the mayor mentioned, first and foremost, it includes funds from the voter-approved Seattle Housing Levy, which continues to meet and exceed its goals. It includes funds from the mandatory housing affordability and incentive zoning programs and resources created by the state that were put immediately to use by Mayor Durkin and City Council. And we thank our state legislators for their action. <laughs> Lastly, a modest amount 
comes from the federal government. And we need far more federal resources, federal reinvestment, if we are to fully address our housing and homelessness challenges. These investments were stewarded effectively by the extraordinary lending team at the Office of Housing, led by Lori Olson, and including Tom Mack, Elsa Kings, Yelius Bender, Charles Mason, and Rosie Zhao. If you would wave and be acknowledged for all of your incredible work. Thank you, community, for your contributions to these investments. And thank you for coming today to share in this celebration of investment in our values and in the proven solution to our housing and homelessness challenge, more affordable homes. Now please welcome Paris. Paris lives at Bellwether Housing's Casa Pacifica, a 65 building unit building close to their job at Youth Care in South Lake Union. Paris is a graduate of Year Up, an organization bringing talented young adults and top companies together to launch careers, power business, and build community. They believe that if people have the resources, support, and opportunity, they will choose to pay it forward. Oof. So one, I want to say thank you all for letting me be here, and thank you, Emily, for the introduction. Um, I'm nervous as hell. <laughs> so <laughs> let's just you move don't right look into nervous, it. Nervous, it's all right. Oof. She feel how hot I am. <laughs> okay. Um, so I guess I want to start off by talking about the fact that I don't believe in telling stories just from where I started in my life. I believe talking about history first and the people that got me to where I am. So my story starts by saying, hello everyone, my name is Paris Chapman. The best way to erase someone's history is to start by saying, and secondly. That's a quote by Chimamanda Ngozi Adichie. She reminded us to study the history of everything that we do and everything that we believe in. And Seattle's housing crisis is due to things that started long before I came to this world. So I like to think about where my great, or where my grandmother started in Skeen, Mississippi. Um, she came here in the 50s. And this was during a time when she had very little education. She still had my uncle. Um, she's yet to have my mother and my aunt. But this woman worked for the Seattle Housing Authority for 28 years. She never had a promotion. She was cleaning houses all of those years. She trained people that was hired over her, like all of these different things that happened to her. And it's sad for me to feel that right now in her 80s, we had to struggle to find her housing because she now has dementia. It's ridiculous. It should not happen. And it's not, it's not just my story. It's everybody's story in this room. If you have elders in your life, you know how hard it is to take care of your parents. You know how hard it is to take care of them and make sure that they have basic needs. So how are you supposed to move forward in life if you can't even take care of them, yeah? Yeah? Yeah. yeah. Okay. So I like to think about my mother as well. My mother grew up in the 60s and 70s. What was going on in the 60s and 70s? Low employment rates for the black community and a crack epidemic. So what did my mother fall into? That exactly. She had to make sure that she could provide for myself and my older brother, and then eventually my younger brother. But my mother, <laughs> my mother had been providing for herself and running the streets since the age of about 12 or 11, because my grandmother did not have the resources to make sure that she could be home and take care of her on a regular basis and provide her with the things that she needed to make sure that she could eventually go on and have housing and have all the resources that I now get to take advantage of. And the same happened to me. So from 14 to about 21, I was struggling with housing off and on, living with people, couch surfing, sometimes staying on the street, but rarely because community supported me. So I'm thankful to all the people that did that for me. But still, it took me a while to get to the point where I understood where I really understood that I didn't have everything that I needed in order to be able to do all the things I eventually wanted to do in my life. So at 21, I found myself graduating, or actually I didn't even get to graduate the program that I was in because again, struggling with housing at that time, working at Forever 21. Have you ever been in Forever 21? <laughs> On Black Friday? <laughs> 
it's an issue. Um, so <laughs> that's where I was working at the time. And then I found out about the program Year Up, which Emily mentioned to you all earlier. And I said, there are no resources where I live right now. I cannot, and I was living in Tacoma at the time. My options were pretty much to figure out how to pay for school, which I, I had nobody in my life who really understood how to find money for school, so I could not go. I just didn't know that it was an option for me. And so I found this program, decided to go into this program, while still struggling with housing, couch surfing, hopping around to friends, commuting two hours back and forth from Tacoma to Seattle every day to make sure that I could attend this program, until eventually I found housing through youth care which is beautiful because that's now where I work and I get to help people in the same way that other people help me. And I would not have been able to do that. So, since then, I've been able to have a seven year career. Whoop, whoop, seven years on me. Um, and in that time, I've been able to support young people in figuring out what does it take to make sure that you can get to where you wanna be, to where you wanna be. Um, and it's not, it's easy to go back and say, go to school, do this, there's a particular path. But I say no. How do you take everything that you've learned from the life that you've lived? How do you take everything that your ancestors have given you and pay that forward? How do you make sure that you use that to better your life so that you can better other people? Because if it wasn't for my ancestors, if it wasn't for you people in this room, if it wasn't for the mayor, I would not be able to do it. I would still be in Tacoma, stuck, maybe working a retail job, which is not what I want to do. It is not what I was put on this earth to do. I have a purpose. I truly believe that my purpose is to help people. I truly believe that my job is to make sure that people understand one of my favorite Oprah quotes. Everyone gets a car. Ooh. <laughs> oh, no, not that, not that one. <laughs> oh, OK. I was ready. <laughs> I just had to give my car up for $350. Um, so her f one favorite quote from Oprah is basically that everybody on this planet has the same ambition and that is to live at your highest expression, to figure out what it is that you truly want to do in life and to become that. It's really, really hard to do that when you're struggling with figuring out what your basic needs are because one, you might not know what those are because you've just been running the streets trying to make whatever happen and just go after the money that you think you need. When you actually needed community, you actually needed support. You actually needed an education. You actually needed somebody to say you are capable of more than just running the streets at this time. All of that stuff is what I do now in my work. So I want to mention that this matters not only because I get to do this work, but also because I work with people every day that are struggling to make sure that they can do this work because as we are helping homeless people, a lot of my coworkers are going homeless themselves. I can't tell you how many times I've received an email from my organization saying, does anybody have a little bit of money to put into this pot so that this person can pay their rent the next month? Another coworker of mine said, you know, when I first started this job, you didn't know this Paris, but I was staying in a shelter. Why? Why does that make sense to anybody? There's no way that that should be happening. We also know that the most affected communities by this are folks who are black, brown, indigenous, and queer. I am all of those things. I have been through this time and time again, and it's a lonely place. But not when you're standing in front of all these beautiful people. And it matters because I've had, I celebrated in October my seventh year being housed. Mm -hmm. And I can't tell you how much that means to me because there's no words to describe what it means to be able to provide for yourself and then take your mother out for dinner because you have the means to. Because I always told her. It's like, I, I just want to make sure you're okay. I just want to take care of you. And I could finally do that. We went to Palisades, it was cute. <laughs> <laughs> so.
So the last thing that I want to say is the, re the reason why this matters so much to me is because, as I said before, I believe that I'm a healer and I believe that a lot of us in this room are and will continue to be. But in order for us to have more healers in our community, in order for our society to heal from all the cracks that we have in it, it's really going to take people being able to focus on what their truest, highest expression is. Yeah? yeah. It's going to take some work to make sure that everybody has the opportunity to move beyond that part of their brain that says, I have to fight, I have to free, or I have to flee the situation, I have to f just tense up and freeze. It's gonna be moving beyond that that takes us where we wanna go in the city. So I wanted to say thank you again to everybody that made this happen. And I don't mean just everybody in this room, I mean everybody from way back in 1950 to the 1800s, everybody that made sure that I could be here, to my ancestors that did not jump ship. I want to say thank you. Thank you, Paris. Um, this shows us that when we make these investments, it's not buildings, it's people. It's investing in those people in our city who can contribute and will contribute. And Seattle leads the way in so many ways. I was really pleased, for example, last week to see that Tacoma decided to give its youth free ORCA passes mm -hmm. after the youth in Rainier Valley insisted upon it and we in a city were able to implement it. Um, we also know that free college for our Seattle students is going to be amazing and already other areas around here are saying how do we make sure our students have that opportunity. Each one of these placards looks like it's just a building. It's so much more than that. Just to get up on this easel are hundreds and hundreds of hours of community aspiration, work to get the financing, work to see how you make it work, who's going to be in the building, who do we serve. So each of these throughout our city, if you look at where they are, is, represents hope. Hope that we can and will be better. Hope that, that young men and young women, like Paris was able to do, to get housed because housing is so fundamental to dignity and to success. And so I want to thank you, Paris and Emily, for, for that, and for all the folks out here who have contributed to the hundreds of hours behind each one of these placards. You all did it because you believe in the missions of your organizations and your communities. You believe we can raise people up. And for that, I'm enormously thankful and I know that any city council member who was here today would also thank you because it really is what animates and motivates our work in this area. So thank you very much. And if there's any questions, Emily or I or Paris be happy to take them. Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor. It's fantastic to be here today. Representing Africa Town. Uh, I think the, the board is here as well. Thank you to everybody here. We're happy to have our place here. Um, so at African Town, we kind of feel like we got the Liberty Bank building going. Very happy today with African Town Plaza. That's number two. We need like 10 or 20 of these. My question to y'all is, what is Why it? stop at 20? Exactly. <laughs> Let's keep it going. My question to you is, what is it that you and Emily, uh, your staff there, saw in value in Africa Town Plaza that got it up here on the board today? Because we want to know so we can keep replicating that and keep putting up more of these buildings. Yeah, that's a great question. So everyone, is, everyone, we get that question a lot is, and that's why I say the hundreds of hours that goes behind each of these buildings, because it has to be, number one, there's got to be land to build it. Two, there's got to be control of that land and a way to get it financing, because while the city can put money in, there has to be promise of other money, so there's always independent fundraising. And there's the promise that it actually can work long term. And you see the, t the buildings that have been in Africa Town, and those have been realized, the one that's up here today. I think that shows that we not just have the need, but as you said, we need more. And we need it not just in the central area, we need it in every part of this city. So we are continuing to work. I don't know if Emily, you want to add to that to really, you know, we have a number of projects that we have people working for the next round. How do we get it ready so that we know when we make that investment from the city of Seattle, it's actually going to be shovel ready, permitted, financing in place, and we can go. Because one thing we know, we cannot build this housing quickly enough. We want to get projects that can work as quickly as we can get them. And there's a number of projects behind us that started years ago. And they came to us and said, what do we need to do to succeed? And we helped them succeed. Ethiopian Community Center is a perfect example of that. 
They said, we have this vision, how do we make it happen? Last year they got a grant through the Equitable Development Initiative to help them get the you know, architectural drawings and all the other structures. This year they get the money. So we have a variety of mechanisms to see how do we realize these buildings and how do we get them in place. Emily, do you want to add to that? That's fine. All right. Uh, but the, the question is now, this is a big piece of the financing, and there's a lot of nice pictures here, but when will these pictures actually become reality? When will we actually see these buildings out of the ground? Each building will be its own building, as we know that construction varies depending on where it is, but the average period of time is about two years. So, and last year you saw the buildings we had up there with our last NOFA, they're about halfway done, and the ones you saw two years ago were just, some of them were opened or ready to open. Um, we're looking at the city, we're working with Emily and others to also see if there's construction ways we have to speed the process up. Um, we're t working with our Office of Permitting to see if we can get affordable housing to the front of the line so it gets its permit quicker, faster. Um, and so we're going to do everything we can to speed up the time from when the award is made to when you see the buildings and people can move in. Two more questions. Mayor Durbin, how are you feeling about um, the status of the Regional Homelessness um, Agency now that the City Council is poised to amend it, which could push it into next year? I think we're going to have that conversation through this week. I'm actually very optimistic we're going to get something done this year. This year? <coughs> yeah. By December 16th? My year ends December 31. <laughs> <laughs> but yours may be shorter. <laughs> One other question. All right. Again, thank you to the Ethiopian community for their hospitality here today. Thank you to all the organizations that made this real. Um, I know how much work that goes in behind it and how much work is left to do. But I will tell you, I've now been some of the greatest moments I have as mayor is to walk when these buildings are opened and see the people walk through those doors that have a home. And often on the first floor now, we're seeing our child care centers, and to see the relief on the parents' face and the joy on the kids' face. That's the very best of Seattle, and we're trying to replicate it as quickly as we can. Thank you very much.